Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm really glad you're here. We march on through this pandemic. <clears throat> I read a little news this morning. I wish I hadn't. It got me all riled up and so many people are saying it's foolish that what we're doing, that government's taking over those kinds of things. Uh, I think it's wisdom what we're doing. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's clear wisdom. The curve is starting to bend now. I read that pres or our governor Inslee has said that it's unlikely that the ban will be or the stay at home order will be lifted before May 4th, that's the date that he had set, but now it looks like it might go well into June. Not sure, we haven't heard yet, but I hope you're staying well, staying safe. It's the strangest thing, we're get, being given a holiday. Uh, we're, on, we're all on vacation. Not the kind of vacation I was looking for, but nevertheless, he makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He's the one who restores our soul. Let's begin with prayer today. Kind and gracious Father, I just thank you for everyone gathered and for those who are yet to join us and those who will be watching later on YouTube, Lord, or on, on Facebook. Just thank you for this opportunity that we have to get together and look into your word, look into its encouragement, and sometimes conviction. The words, the words of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 come to mind, Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. But in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And so, Father, we acknowledge you today. We know you. It's the word there is more than just a brief acknowledgement. It's knowing you intimately. So, Father, we ask that you would make our path straight through this pandemic and out to the other side. I pray that as we're in the middle of a political election year, that you would help our leaders on all sides. You would keep them from politicizing this pandemic. That they would be united together against this scourge that we're experiencing. I pray for wisdom for all of our leaders, for President Trump, for Nancy Pelosi, for Mitch McConnell, for all the senators and representatives in the House, for our governors across this nation for the state legislators, both senators and representatives, Lord, and for our city officials. I pray that you would encourage them, that you would give them insight and wisdom and knowledge and understanding beyond their own abilities or beyond their own capacity. I pray that as we now see the curve starting to bend and the death rates are now going down in terms of the daily count. I pray that you would give them much wisdom all from the national level to the state level down to the local level. They would, you would give them much wisdom and understanding to know when to release the stay-at-home orders. Lord, lots of young people have lost their jobs the greatest group of people who have lost their jobs are between 18 and, and their 30s, the millennials. And Father, I just uh, pray for each one of those young people that you would encourage them. That you would strengthen them. But more than anything, Lord, we pray that you, for whatever reason you're allowing this pandemic, that you would be drawing people's hearts towards you, that people would come to know your name, that people would come to know what you've done for them in and through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, his resurrection and his ascension, and, in, 
and in the giving of the Spirit to us, Lord. I pray for the scientists who are working on either a cure or a vaccine or antibodies that can be used to treat it. I pray that a viable medication or vaccine would be found quickly, Lord. I pray for all of our families, Lord. This is an extremely stressful time. I don't think any of us realize how taxing it is on our psych, psyche and our, our sense of well-being. So, Father, you be the one who restores our soul. You be the one who restores our mind, our will, and our emotions. Thank you that you are the Good Shepherd that your goodness and mercy, those sheepdogs of goodness and mercy, shall follow us all the days of our life. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I thank you that we already are your house. You have made us your temple, Lord, and that is, it boggles my mind, Lord, to think that you have come to live within us, that we have become the holy, the holy of holies, the holy place. your will written on tablets of human hearts. And I pray for everybody listening and those who are yet to listen, that you would bless each one of them, that you would let them know your presence with them, that you would keep them safe, that they would not contract this virus. And we entrust all of our lives into your hands knowing that your path leads straight through this pandemic. See us to the other side, Lord. See us to the other side. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So partly when I was reading the news today, I read about a man, I feel really bad for him, but he was one of the scoffers who was um, accusing the government of taking over and that kind of thing. And he contracted the disease and died I think just yesterday. Please pray for his family. I don't condemn him. But this is an equal opportunity infector, if you will. It infects everybody, whether you're a Christian or not. Or And so we can pray for wisdom. We can pray for discernment in watching sometimes the sensationalism of the news. It's one thing I've gotten into the habit of just praying for discernment in my life before watching a movie. I haven't done that in a while, but before watching a movie, praying for discernment, letting me know what's true, what isn't. And in the midst of all this news and all these Facebook posts we're getting, it's wise to pray for discernment. What's true, what's not. So we're looking at Psalm 16 today. It's a little bit different. We've been in a series of laments. And the last one was this rather strange psalm that heralded the righteous man. And we saw that the only righteous man is Jesus himself. And now we come to a, a psalm of delight, a psalm of praise, in which David recounts all the good things in his life and contrasts it with those who worship other gods. In our society, who is the chief god that we worship? Self. Just believe in yourself. And we have a sacrifice made to the God of self that is akin to that God, and that is abortion. We sacrifice babies to self. Oh Lord, please change us. Please open the eyes of our nation and our world. So let's read the psalm and then I'll give you some thoughts on it, meditation afterwards. Psalm 16, verses 1 through 11. Be reading from the New American Standard Bible, and it's a Mictum of David. We're not sure what these terms mean, but it may mean a, a psalm of praise. We, we really don't know. So reading, Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are, on, who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. 
The sorrow of those who have bartered for another God will, will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell, will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo, undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. I like that last one. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. So let's take a look at this psalm. Get a drink here. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. The word preserve here means to keep or to guard. It's the same word taken as a, a watchman on the wall. Somebody would be out looking out for the city behind the closed gates. So David is asking that God would be his night watchman, would be his guard. Preserve me, O God. What a wonderful prayer for this epidemic and for our time. Preserve me, O God. For I take refuge in you. For I seek safety in you. I seek protection in you. Notice that it's not from him, but it's actually in the Lord. For I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. It's such a contrast with the last psalm because in the last psalm, David heralds this righteous man. Uh, he says things like, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. And the psalm went on and on. Here we have David saying, I have no good besides you. So he's getting at God is his watchman. God is his refuge. You are my Lord. He's, he's the master, the one who is in sovereign control over the whole universe. And he's David's master. And I have no good besides you. That's a truth that's borne out in the New Testament. We saw last Friday the rich young ruler when he came running up to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God alone. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. And so the saints would be those Torah-keeping Jews, those law-keeping Jews who are in covenant with God, who are doing their best to keep the covenant. That would be how the saints, the saints are defined in David's mind. To us, it's those who are washed in the blood of Christ, who have entrusted their life to him, who have been persuaded to believe that he is the one through whom all things were created, that they have been persuaded to believe that he is God in the flesh. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones. I like that word majestic. It can be used of trees. And so there's this kind of image of trees going on. When he says, I take refuge in you, literally that means I take, I find shade in your branches, if you will, under underneath the branches. And so it's kind of using this pictorial language. The Hebrew people love to use pictorial language. They thought in pictures. And so this first couple of verses have this idea of trees in it. And now he says, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. So he rejoices in those men and women in their society. Sometimes the word, the majestic ones, could be used of the nobles and rulers, the princes and so on. 
But I think he's referring here to those who are the covenant-keeping Israelites, the covenant-keeping Hebrews. He delights in them. Well, we delight in those who have been saved by the blood of Christ. No matter where you've come from, no matter what your past has been, he has this wonderful ability to transform our lives. He has the power of his grace to take us from wicked human beings and he's fashioning us into the very image of Christ. These are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. And then he turns and contrasts those majestic ones with the following. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another god will be multiplied. Bartered is literally the word for giving a dowry, but it means purchasing uh, sorrows uh, from another god. The sorrows of those who have bar bar bartered for another god will be multiplied. So all around the nation of Israel, there were nations that were going after the other gods. And what he's getting at, they had to pay for the privilege of worshiping them. And all it did was create sorrow in their life that would be ever multiplied. It's not ad addition here, it's multiplication. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another god will be multiplied. They've sold their souls to these so-called gods and instead of joy and peace and grace and goodness and eternal hope, they end up with just sorrow. Think about that in our own, in our own nation, in our own world. As I've said earlier today, our God is self. We have so many words associated with self, self-aggrandizement, self-fulfillment, self-realization, self-actualization. Just believe in yourself. When our girls were young, we liked to watch teen movies with them. And uh, ad nauseum, the message was, just believe in yourself. That's the lie from the Garden of Eden, that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The lie that's repeated in Romans chapter 1, they exchange the truth of God for the lie, and then he tells us that, what that lie is, and worship the creation rather than, rather than the creator. And so now we're worshiping not just the creation, we're worshiping self as a society. And as a result, sorrows have been multiplied in people's lives. There's consequences to our behavior. As I've said before, God is not a curmudgeon up in heaven who delights in keeping us from having fun. At the end of the psalm, we, we see that his pleasures are eternal. They're, they'll never end, the pleasures that he will give to us. So he's not a curmudgeon, but he knows that certain behaviors, certain actions on our part have consequences. And whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or a pre-Christian, it doesn't matter. There are consequences to what we do and how we live, what we say. And sometimes I think the consequences for Christians are worse because when we do those things that he's told us, warned us not to do, it's like Pandora's box, we not only reap the consequences, but then we reap the conviction of the Holy Spirit telling us not to do those things. And it can be very, very painful, as many of you know, as all of you know. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. Where is this message? Just believe in yourself, getting our nation. Don't you see that it's multiplying people's sorrow? I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood. This is much debated about what this means. I think in the context, if you think about the context culturally in their day, David was surrounded and the Israelites were surrounded by all these pagan nations who worshiped other gods. And when David says, I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, there refers to these other gods, not to the people worshiping, but to these other gods. And so these other gods were demanding sacrifices of blood. And so David isn't going to join in these, worshiper, these worshipers who are being required to pour out drink offerings of blood. We're pouring out drink offerings of blood to the God we serve, the God of self, in the form of abortion. We're at, hovering at around 66 million people. 
when Cain killed Abel. Abel's blood cried out from the ground and the Lord heard it. They heard the cry of Abel's blood. The Lord heard the cry of one man's blood who had been murdered. I wonder what the sound of the cries of 66 million babies' blood sounds like to our Lord. And what the sound of the blood of over a billion babies aborted worldwide since 1973. I wonder what the sound of their blood sounds like to our Lord. We all have blood on our hands. This society is pouring out a drink offering to the God of self, to the God of selfishness. Just have it your way. Nor will I take their names upon my lips. David isn't even going to name these gods. He's just going to let it go. He's not going to even honor them enough to, to speak their name. We move on. That was in contrast to these are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. And he says, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. So if you think about that, the Lord, and it's L-O-R-D, so we know it's the, word, the name Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. They call it the Tetragrammaton, which means four letters. So it's the four letters of God's holy name. The I am, it's associated with I am who I am. And Jesus comes along and he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. The Lord is a portion of my inheritance. So there's this inheritance and the portion that David is allotted is Lord himself. So Jesus is our inheritance. Right now we have the first deposit by the Spirit, Jesus living within. But can you imagine when we live in the fullness of Jesus being our portion? And he's and then he says, the Lord is a portion of my inheritance and my cup. I'm reminded of the words in Psalm 23, my cup overflows. And so this idea of cup was all the goodness that has been poured into my life, that has been poured into David's life, that has been poured into your life. I look back over the years and God has been so kind to me. Jesus has, has been so kind to me gracious to me, that hesed love, that long-suffering love, never giving up on me. He goes, he says, you support my lot. That lot, again, means a portion. It was used of the dividing up of the land to the different tribes. You support my lot. So you guard, you protect the portion that you've given to me. I don't have to protect it. You protect it. And what's our portion? Our portion is eternal life and eternal life, not just unending days, but eternal life lived out in the boundless, immeasurable, unfathomable, inconceivable love of God. Don't go there. I know what you're thinking. Inconceivable. He loves us so much. And we're going to be able to bask in his love and grace for all eternity. We have nothing to fear. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. So the boundaries of, of the portion given to him of his lot have fallen to, to David in pleasant places. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places as well. I came to this church kicking and screaming in, inwardly because I had planned to be a missionary, prepared to be a missionary for 10 years after my head injury. Got to Japan, was in language school for, for two years, and then started praying, Lord, teach me what it me, teach me to walk in your spirit and to live in your spirit. 
And just a week before starting to plant house churches, which was my dream, was to be under a Japanese senior pastor and to plant house churches, he whisks us back to the United States. I did not want to put my name out for a church while I was here. Grace Community Covenant Church in Olympia was so gracious to me. Greg Oliver, they offered me an interim position after I had been working with the, uh, while I was working Actually, when we first came home, I was in, interim pastor, associate pastor there for six months. And then I worked another year for, or another six months for the, the mission itinerating. And then I was out of a job and I was not going to put my name out to get a church here because I, want, I was dead set on going back to Japan. Finally, my wife said to me, Grant, if you don't put your name out, how will you know? And so I put my name out and I got called here to Brever Bremerton. God made it very clear that this is where he wanted me to come. I assumed that I would be here about six years. And now I've in my 25th year here. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. I so love this congregation. I so love this community. What a blessing in my life, in my family's life, to have had the privilege to live here. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. Again, that word heritage has to do with the portion that's been given to him. He's talking about the same thing all the way through. And really, it's the Lord. Wherever I am, I have the Lord. I have Jesus. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Even at the end of right before the, he ascended, he said to the disciples, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with us always. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. If the Lord is our portion, if he is our heritage, well, he's beyond beautiful. He is beyond wonderful. He is so gracious, so loving, so kind. Oh, that we would get to know his kind heart. Oh, that we would grow in the grace, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We grow, not in rules, not in our own strength, not in our own effort, but we grow in the grace, in that undeserved, unmerited, kind and generous power to forgive, save, and transform broken and sinful lives forever. We grow in, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So to know Jesus is to know his grace. To know his grace is to know Jesus. Indeed, our heritage is beyond beautiful to us. It continues and it says, I will bless the Lord. I will bless Yahweh. How do we bless the Lord? It's just acknowledging who he is, shouting out his praise, singing his goodness, telling people of his incredible kindness and grace and love, his patience. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. I love this. David has the Lord, God, as his counselor. So oftentimes I look to the news for, for counsel. I look to other people at times for counsel. I look to the news and politicians for counsel. I had my favorite brand of new news and in the changes of my life, one thing I've learned is to step back away from politics and away from the media, realizing that it's all biased and to remember that I'm a citizen and you are a citizen of heaven. This home, this world is not our home. And the Lord has counseled me. Jesus has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. Do you ever have that happen? You wake up in the middle of the night and you wake up to either a nightmare or to a racing mind or to thoughts that you can't, you just can't get your mind shut off. In those times, I've learned to be still. When I first received the diagnosis of cancer, I 
focused on Isaiah 42, 11. I don't think I can quote it to you right now, but I, would, I had it printed on a card next to my pillow. And when I would wake up in the middle of the night to the thought that I have cancer, or later on to the thought that I have stage four cancer, it was extremely troubling. To the point that sometimes I would just be sobbing in the middle of the night. And I would turn to Isaiah 42, 11, and I would read those words and remember his promises. This is what it says. Is it 42, 11? No. Nope. I think I got the wrong verse. Wrong chapter. It's 43, I think. Let me see here. Sorry about this. Nope, can't find it, so I won't worry about it. I will let you know which what it is later. I'll put it in the comments. At any rate, through those words and through the still small voice of the, the Spirit, 4110, that's what it was. It was off by one chapter and one verse each direction. Do not fear. What a great word for today. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will hope, help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand or my victorious right hand. Do not fear, for I am with you. The Lord is our portion. And he would instruct me in the night then. Oftentimes in the middle of the night when I wake up and I can't go to sleep, it's, it's time to sit with the Lord. And he instructs us. He gives us counsel in the watches of the night. I have set the Lord, I have set Jesus continually before me. For David, he didn't know that, that the Lord was Jesus. He knew Yahweh. I've set Yahweh continually before me. So instead of looking at the circumstances of life all around him, he focused on Yahweh by continually placing him in front of him, keeping him in view, not idols, not his own strength, not the counsel of the world, but Jesus, Yahweh. It says in Colossians 2, 8, I think it is, uh, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge if you need wisdom if you need knowledge if you need guidance if you need counsel there's no better place than to go to Yahweh than to go to Jesus to seek the Holy Spirit who is how Jesus is mediated to us now in the mystery of the Trinity I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. It's not that Jesus is on David's right hand. It's that David is on because he is at my right hand. What it's getting at is that Jesus is there, that Yahweh is there to protect him through whatever comes. We don't have to be shaken. We don't have to be shaken by this pandemic. We don't have to be shaken by illness or cancer or heart disease <coughs> or liver troubles or fear or worry or the possibility of financial collapse and depression or depression itself, what we're talking about, emotional and psychological depression. It's real, folks. I will not be shaken when I keep the Lord in front of me. You don't have to be shaken by whatever, whatever is happening in your life if you keep Jesus in front of you. He is our goal. He is the one we're following across the finish line. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices my flesh also will dwell securely. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. 
because of all these things, that God is his goodness or his good, that God is his protector, that he's his watchman, and all these good things he's just named, his heart overflows with joy. His heart is glad. And my glory rejoices. All I can think of is David has had glory as a king. But he's not talking about his own glory. And my glory rejoices. My glory is in the Lord. My glory is in Yahweh. And when my glory is in him, my glory rejoices. I rejoice. My flesh also will dwell securely, my body. I don't need to fear whatever may come. And then get this, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Sheol is the place of the dead, it's the grave, from which no one can praise. To Hebrew people, Sheol wasn't like a waiting place, it was the place of non-being. There was progressive revelation that we came to understand things greater with the New Testament. But to the Hebrew person, when you died, you were dead. They did have a sense of the afterlife, though, because look at what David says, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol once my body is gone, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo, undergo decay, your Godly One. Now, David is speaking of himself, that doesn't make any sense because David died and he underwent decay. And so suddenly David has become prophet. He is now prophesying of the Messiah to come. For you will not abandon my soul to shield, Jesus' words, nor will you allow your Holy One to under, undergo decay. The Holy One is Jesus. And then it finishes up with, you will make known to me the path of life. Where does that path of life lead? You see that path right there. Where does it lead? It leads to eternal life. It leads to heaven. It leads to paradise. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. There are pleasures forever. Do you have any idea what's destined for us? We've been looking at it in 2 Corinthians on Sundays. These light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. We have destined for us an indestructible, imperishable, immortal body. And here we find out that there are pleasures, pleasures, that he will be giving us throughout all eternity. Wow. So as I think about this, these last three verses about, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Also above that, my flesh also will dwell securely. You, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the paths of life, of life, in your presence is fullness of joy. As I think about those words, it came to my attention in my studies that they are quoted several times, at least twice, once by Paul, but also in the book of Acts, by Peter in his sermon in Acts chapter 2. So very quickly, Peter is this bumbling man who keeps putting his foot in his mouth. He promises, uh, promises Jesus that he won't betray him, that he won't deny him. And Jesus says, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Jesus and Paul, Peter says, by no means, I promise, I'll even go to the death with you. And he's going to carry it out by cutting off Malchus's ear. Jesus heals Ma Malchus's ear so that Peter doesn't have to be tried. If there's no evidence, how can he be tried? But Peter then denies his Lord. And in that wonderful story of the fishing trip after the resurrection, when they see Jesus on the shore and Peter plunges himself in the water, he comes running to Jesus, finds Jesus over a charcoal fire. The last time he was over a charcoal fire was when he denied him. Jesus looked at him, 
over a charcoal fire and their eyes met right after that last de denial. Here Jesus has made a charcoal fire serving breakfast to them. And then Jesus reinstates Peter to his call to ministry, to his call to be an apostle. He reinstates him three times, each reinstatement for each denial. And then you have this bumbling Peter who rebuked Jesus for saying that he had to go to the cross. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls on Peter. And he preaches this incredible sermon in which 3,000 people afterwards come to faith in Christ, gain eternal life. And it's in that sermon that we find these words quoted. In Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 33, we're not going to read the whole sermon, but just these verses. So in the New, New American Standard Bible, when, they, when you see all these capitals, they're kind of hard to read, but it makes it stand out that this is being quoted from the Hebrew Scriptures. And what, they, what um, Peter is quoting from is this very psalm, Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. For David says of him, for David says of Jesus, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I not, will not be shaken. And we read back in the psalm, I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the light. I have set the Lord continually before me. Peter's a little bit loose in his translation, probably because he's um, quoting from the Septuagint. That's the Bible they, they knew. It's a little bit different than the Masoretic text, but they also had the freedom to play with words. I saw the Lord always in my presence. Here it is. In, I have set the Lord continually before me. And it says, He is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. And in the psalm it says, Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Almost verbatim there. So Peter is saying this to the very people who had killed Jesus. I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I, I will not be shaken. He continues the quote, Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. So this is what David spoke of the Lord. So we go back to the psalm, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. He says, Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted in the glory of God. And then it says, um, let's see, I'm getting mixed up here. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Look what the psalm actually says. My flesh also will dwell securely. Now we live in hope. Not just hope for this temporal life, this earthly life, this physical life, but we live in the sure hope of eternal life. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo undergo decay. Hades would have been the word used in the Greek Septuagint for Sheol, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to under, undergo decay. So these are Jesus' words, prophetic words of David, speaking of Jesus. <clears throat> Even in Jesus' time while on the, this earth, as he approached the cross, these words gave Jesus comfort and hope. Nor will you for you will not abandon my soul to the grave, to Hades, to Sheol. Nor will you allow your Holy One, the Messiah, to under, undergo decay. The Hebrew people said that you weren't all the way dead until you had been dead for four days. Lazarus, when Jesus tarried, he waited until Lazarus was all the way dead. There's a wordplay on it in the movie you're thinking about, The Search for the Holy Grail. I'm not dead yet. I'm just mostly dead, or he's just mostly dead. That's, uh, and also from Princess Bride, those ideas. Jesus was in the tomb for three days in, in how they counted. They always counted the first day. We don't count the first day. So we, he was in the tomb before sundown. So he was in the tomb Friday. He was in the tomb Saturday. And he was in the tomb Sunday morning. 
So three days. He didn't get to the fourth day where the decay would have been starting to set in, where his body would have become putrid and there would have been a stench like with Lazarus. Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Speaking so clearly of our Lord Jesus Christ and while he was in the grave, we're told that he was preaching to the captives in prison. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon our souls to Hades, nor will you allow your saints to undergo permanent decay. We will undergo decay, but we have those brand new resurrection, undestructible, indestructible bodies to look forward to. He continues with his quote, Peter, in, in his sermon. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of gladness. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And so in the psalm it says, you will make known to me the path of life. Here it says, you will, ha you will have made known to me the ways of life. Very similar language, the way, the word way and path, it's, it's the same idea. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. So he sums that up by saying, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Think about this when we get into his presence. Huh? Is he going to look at you and go, man, I'm so disappointed in you. You blew it so many times, I don't even know if I'm going to accept you. That's not how he's going to respond to us. He's going to say, welcome home. My beloved son, my beloved daughter. We have run the race. We have fought the fought. And sometimes we've failed, but he picks us up, dusts us off, fills us with his presence again, and then we get back to the race of life. And then David continues, speaking of what this psalm, these words in Psalm 16 mean to, mean to him. Brethren, I may confident, confidently say to you, regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, he's saying that those verses in Psalm 16, where he says, my Holy One will not undergo decay, it can't be talking about David because David was dead. He did undergo decay. He's buried in the tomb where they know where, where the tomb is. His tomb is with us today. We know it can't be speaking of David. And so because he was a prophet, and so he's getting, Peter is getting at that David spoke prophetically in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne. We won't go into those quotations from the, from the Hebrew scriptures. But because God had sworn to him in, in an oath, which he cannot lie, that there would be a descendant that would sit on his throne, that descendant is Jesus. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Decay. David spoke those words around 10, around 1,000 years B.C., before Christ. David reigned from 1011 to 971 B.C. He reigned for 40 years. So right at about 1,000 years before Christ, he prophesied about the Messiah, about the Christ, about this descendant of his who would rule on his throne. Amazing. And then look what David then says. This Jesus, God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. All the disciples with Peter gathered there and likely in Solomon's portico in the temple because it had to be a place large enough where 3,000 people at least could be listening, probably many more. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says that there was over 514 eyewitnesses of Jesus that were still alive when Paul wrote this. Peter is saying that he was an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
they would have had the opportunity to see him, to touch him, to hear his voice. They saw him eating food. I'm sure they touched his hands and his side. That which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have touched with our hands. This we proclaim to you, the eternal life which was with God the Father. So the re resurrection is not just some pie-in-the-sky theology. It's a reality that it was attested to by more witnesses necessary than, most, than any courtroom. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, had, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Having been crucified, it cleansed our lives of all of our sin. All of our sins have been forgiven in the cross of Christ. And therefore, he was raised to life, by which Romans says we are saved. We, are, we were in him when he was raised, and by that we are guaranteed eternal life, that we are saved when we've entrusted our life to him. But it doesn't end there. He didn't just forgive us and then make us alive to then wallow in our inability to live the right kind of life. He ascended into heaven so that God could send the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, so that God could put that first deposit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Hmm. I just love having the Holy Spirit in my life. Without him, I am nothing. I'm but a cracked pot, an earthen vessel. I'm just baked clay who's wearing out. But I have this treasure of the ministry of the Spirit in this earthen vessel to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Do I full know this one? Do I know this one full well now? Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. He has poured forth that which you both see and hear. They heard people speaking in tongues. They heard, uh, they saw the tongues of fire come, come upon them as the Holy Spirit descended. So we look at these verses quoted. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me. What wise counsel for this pandemic to set the Lord ever before you. Keep him in focus. Don't get your focus on the st statistics. Don't get your focus on the protesters and non-protesters protesters. Don't get your focus set on politics or on the worry about what's going to happen to our economy or about what's going to happen to your job. Will there be food on our table? Keep Jesus in front of you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the king. And all of these other things will be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his goodness, his power, his grace, his love, the peace that he would give, that eternal hope, the joy of the Lord. Keep Jesus in front of you. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Because he is at our right hand, we will not be shaken. We will not be shaken by whatever life throws at us, whether it's pandemic, whether it's illness, whether it's financial collapse, whether if it's uh, not a lot of food on our table. We won't be shaken because the Lord is with us. His presence is with us. Therefore, my heart is glad. I can have joy in the midst of all of this. And my glory rejoices. I rejoice in the glory of God, in his kindness, in his loving kindness. The Lord, the Lord, the compassion and gracious God, gracious God abounding in loving kindness, that steadfast, hesed, 
covenant love and truth. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You're not just going to leave me dead once I go through those gates. Nor will you allow your saint to undergo decay. Well, I'm not Jesus, so that's not entirely true of my life. I will undergo decay, and so will you. But in the long haul, in this light and momentary affliction in this moment, the comparison with eternity, we will be given these indestructible bodies, these immortal bodies, imperishable bodies, and we will not undergo permanent decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. I think about that path of life. It's not just any path. In John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the path, I am the truth and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice, says, no, notice that it says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but, my, but by me. There's a single path. There's a single path that leads to eternal life, and it's only had through Jesus Christ. No other way. All the roads don't lead to the mountaintop. There's only one road that leads from the mountaintop down to us, and Jesus has come to us to take us home. Ponder this psalm in the midst of this pandemic, that he is our portion, that he is in our, our inheritance, that the only goodness we have, the only good we have is from him, and that he is the path of life that leads to his presence and leads to eternal life, that Jesus himself is the path, he is the truth, and he is our life. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this psalm. I thank you how it's quoted by Peter in his sermon. And it speaks of the very thing that Peter and the other disciples, the apostles, had witnessed. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, along with Mary Magdalene and Martha and Mary and Lazarus. They were all witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They saw him alive. Over 514 people were eyewitnesses to your son walking on the planet, resurrected from the dead, resurrected not just to a body that would die again like Lazarus, but red resurrected to an indestructible life. You've placed eternity in our hearts, Lord. We long for that indestructible life. We long for no more pain, no more sorrow, no more grief, no more mourning, no more death. Lead us in your path, Lord. The good shepherd leads us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. And when we get off the path, when we get lost in the woods, Lead us back onto the path, onto your path. It leads straight into your very heart. And it turns out that you are the path, that you are the author of our life, that you are the author of our the course we live on. I love the author of Hebrews words, Lord, penned by your Holy Spirit. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, including David and all those who had gone on before, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance, everything that burdens us, and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race, the path that is set before us. By fixing our eyes on Jesus, by putting Jesus continually in front of us, Father, help us to do this. Remind us when we get our eyes on the things that trouble us, when we get our minds set on the things that trouble us. 
remind us that you set the course, you ran the race, you finished the race, you designed the course, and you finished the course. Now we have the very one who ran our race for us. And we look to you, whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, whatever hardship, may we be given the grace to keep Jesus continually in front of us. May we give, be given the grace to fix our eyes solely and completely and wholly on our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. That scripture I read was from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, actually 1 and 2. What a rich psalm. I encourage you to re read it throughout this day, to ponder it when you get a chance to meditate on it. Take a look at Peter's sermon. Again, thank you for joining me. I'll be back tomorrow with Psalm 17 and on Thursday, Psalm 18. And then Friday, I won't be able to be here because it's our ministerium annual, annual meeting. We'll be gathering over Zoom for the pastors in our conference's business meeting. And then on Saturday, we're having our conference annual meeting over Zoom. So I'll just be here for th three Psalms this week. I'm really glad that you're, you're joining me, both those who were able to see the live stream and also those of you who are watching this later. Thank you for the honor that you give me in watching and listening. May you have a, a blessed day filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with joy and pleasures unending. Let's close with prayer. Oh, we already did that. Let's close with our blessing. From Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, with by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, will keep or guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thanks again. Hope to see you tomorrow.